Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lefteris Karalambus, and I'm a partner with McKinsey. Along with Lucas Yomas, we co-lead our work on energy and heavy industry. Today, and in the context of the forum, we would like to share with you our perspective on how Europe can reach net zero emissions at net zero cost. Thank you very much, Lefteri. Um, many of the esteemed speakers of this forum um, have actually focused on the facts around climate change and they have actually reinforced the messages around why climate change is the defining issue of our times. Now, recognizing this imperative, we have actually invested significant time during this last year in order to define how Europe can lead the way on climate response and reach net zero emissions at net zero cost. Our analysis revealed six important insights. First and foremost, this is doable. Europe can reach net zero emissions at net zero cost in the next 25 to 30 years. The second is, each sector will have its own pace. Power will start and then other sectors will follow. The third thing is, it is essential for energy systems to be fully reimagined in order for the goal to be achieved. Primary energy demand from 75% fossil fuels today needs to go to more than 80% renewables by 2050. Four, it is extremely good that we have many proven technologies in the lead. 60% of the reduction until 2050 will come from technologies which are either fully mature or in early stages of adoption. Five, we need to invest a lot. It is a capex game, but it will save a lot of opex. And number six, there are a few socioeconomic imperatives that we need to always keep top of mind. Let's please move to the next page. Now, if we look at the journey ahead, the journey towards net zero in 2050, but also the very recent commitment of the union towards 55% reduction in emissions by 2030, we will be able to recognize that Europe has done a lot the last few years with approximately 35 million tons reduction per year. But the journey ahead is a very bold one with 130 million tons of CO2 reduction required in the next 10 years annually and 110 for the next 30. So we are talking about a significant task ahead. Let's go to the next page, please. If we look at our start, right, what is our baseline? Where do we actually start this journey from? and the different sectors that emit CO2 and GHG gases today. We see that there is a lion's share attributed to power and transport with the building space as well as a fragmented industry and agriculture following, plus significant emissions which are shared with other countries outside of the Union, like those coming from aviation and shipping. Next. Now, we referred at the beginning to how each sector will respond to this impressive and difficult journey. And it looks like some sectors will have a head start and some others will need to follow. The power sector, armed with the maturity of what is happening in the renewable space, will come first, which is a very good thing. We will see many important developments in regard to decarbonization and power between the today and the next nine, 10 years. Transport with a lot of hype and a lot of power coming from the electric vehicles revolution will start its journey in the next 10 years, but it will actually peak in the next 20. And then we see buildings, industry and agriculture following with technology and investments that are required in order to make these sectors to pick up decarbonization in the next 10 years. Let's please move to the next page. Now, no one can claim that this journey is going to be an easy journey, as we said at the beginning. But the good thing is we have two important good news. Now, the first good news, piece of good news, is that we have many different levers that we can utilize in order to get to net zero and to our commitments. The electrification and carbon neutral power will actually be a lever that will be in the lead throughout the journey to 2050. 
with carbon neutral hydrogen creating its own economy after 2030, 2035. And carbon capture also playing a very important role in the last decade of these few years. Next. The second piece of very good news is that if we look at the full spectrum of those decarbonization levers and we plot them at what we call an abatement curve, it is evident that many of those levers are today in the money and many other levers that you see on the right side of this curve will actually become economic in the next few years as CO2 prices are going up towards the $100 mark and as technology develops. The combination of currently net uh, present value positive levers and those that will get into the net present value positive territory in the next few years indicates that we can actually get to where we need to get at net zero cost. And now I would like to pass over to my colleague Lefteris to walk us through the important actions to get there. Thank you, thank you, Luca. And clearly the stakes are very high, right? Um, now let's discuss what needs to happen to actually walk this path, to reach this uh, very you know, ambitious target. Europe will have to commit to four action areas to make this happen. Number one, innovation. As also Lucas mentioned, technology will play a significant part in this journey through all these various applications that we need to uh, come together. And just to give you a sense, the top 15 applications would account for 70% of the abatement. The top four, one of them was CCS that also Lucas mentioned, would account for one more than one third of the abatement by 2050. And we can cluster all of these applications in four categories depending on the current state of development. The mature technologies that have been around and proven for many, many years, PVs, wind farms, and so on. The ones that are in early adoption, proven, but yet in the early stages of the scale up, electric vehicles, heat pumps, demonstrated technologies that have been proven at pilot or experimental mode, but still do not have a clear scale up path, or their economic model is not very obvious under current market conditions, like CCS. And then finally, the least proven technologies, the ones that are in R&D mode, still not proven at all, actually. One example is electric furnaces. And as you can imagine, these technologies, the technology risk associated with them, vary significantly in different time horizons. By 2030, we can reach the abatement using 90 by 90% 90 mature and technologies in early adoption. This is completely different by 2050 where only 60% can be achieved with similar technologies. And on top of that, around 15% of the abatement will have to come from unproven technologies that even today have very challenging economic outlook. A full ecosystem of innovation, as you can imagine, needs to be in place involving industry players, industrial associations, policymakers to drive the innovation needed. And at the end, we will reach a point where Europe will shift away from fossil fuel, but we may run into a reliance risk on these new technologies, especially if the solutions or the materials associated with them will come from abroad. Number two, industrialization. The, the name of the game here is scaling up all these technologies. As we mentioned also before, the power sector, for example, will play a critical role with shifting from around 40% of the primary energy demand going through the power sector to more than 75% by 2050. As a result, a lot of its components will have to scale up materially. Renewables, for example, will have to triple by 2030 and then triple again by 2050. Another example, carbon capture and storage that will be used to capture the remaining um, emissions from fossil fuel, from biofuel, and also the, um, the chemical industries of the industrial uh, processes. CCS will have to start from practically zero basis, reach around 30 million tons of CO2 equivalent by, by 2030, and then grow by six times by 2050. This will require setting up and stretching the value chains and the markets for these technologies to reach this pace, something that seems not very obvious right now. Number three, infrastructure. Our proposed path 
requires completely different features in Europe's infrastructure. And this is needed to accommodate the scale of change, the shift in technology, but also the much more dynamic nature of this new normal. And this will cover existing infrastructure that will have to be repurposed or scaled up, but also completely new infrastructure, hydrogen pipelines, CO2 storage. Number four, investments. We will have to mobilize more than 28 trillion of euro by 2050. This will come, of course, from repurposing or redirecting more than 730 billion per year, but also through the um, commitment of additional 180 billion per year of investments. This will have to happen to trigger a shift of our economic model from a heavy OPEX reliance model to a heavy CAPEX model that will result to savings of OPEX. We estimate that to be around 130 billion per year. However, even with this dynamic, around 50% of these investments still are not straightforward based on today's investment decisions that have a specific time horizon in mind. What are the incentives that need to come in play to drive this forward and trigger these investments? That we need to see. And if we move next and we take the society view of things, this effort could result in a net job creation. By 2030, we could be looking at more than 2.2 net uh, new jobs. And by 2050, almost 5 billion, 5 million, sorry, with the power and the construction sectors enjoying most of the gain. This could come from jobs related to the manufacturing, installation, maintenance of um, activities related to the new technologies, and of, and of course, energy efficiency related activities. On the flip side, the transportation and the heavy industry sectors will be hit the most. If we take the household view now, we expect costs to remain relatively the same, although we will have a shift on the split. We expect a significant reduction on the transportation cost, because again, it's shifting from OPEX to CAPEX, uh, but also an increase in cost related to food and services. Going forward now, if we move to the next page, please. Decisive actions are required by policymakers and business leaders to reset the economy. What we are talking about is actually resetting the economy of Europe. And this will cover all areas of activity, from capital allocation, that will have to take sustainability as an input when you decide on investments, and also incentives to trigger some investments that based on today's in investment criteria would not be straightforward reskilling and redeploying the workforce of Europe. We estimate something like 18 million jobs would be directly affected by this shift. Also, the coordination and convergence between different stakeholders, social preferences, but also collaboration between the private sector and the state. Finally, proactive and longer term view policies and regulations. This will sometimes have a conflict since they may have a completely different short-term effect that needs to be absorbed for the long-term good. And then finally, if we move to the next page, recapping on a few basic messages. In our view, we strongly believe that net zero Europe at net zero cost is achievable. Every sector will go at its own pace, taking into account the specificities and the readiness of each sector. The power sector most likely will lead the way. Energy systems, and particularly the power sector, will be pivotal to that. However, they will have to be reimagined and they will have to evolve to meet this great demand. Technology will be the key enabler. And yes, 60% of the impact will come from mature or in early adoption technologies. However, another 40% will have to come from new technologies. The innovation ecosystem in place will have to play a critical role for that. This will result in shifting Europe's model from a heavy OPEX to a heavy CAPEX model. However, to achieve this, mobilizing around 28 trillion of investments by 2050 will be required. And along with that, a complete capital transformation along all dimensions, financial, human, physical, and natural. So this is Europe. I guess the question is, 
can we also do something similar for Greece? Thank you for listening and for giving us the opportunity to share with you our perspective on achieving a net zero emissions Europe. Thank you, good afternoon.